Welcome back to Light the Fuse. I guess we're still a Mission Impossible podcast. I don't even know. I mean, you ever have those kind of existential crises, Charles, where you look in the mirror and you say, what is this all for? What am I <laughs> doing with my life? All that? Yeah, yeah. Every morning I wake up and I look at myself in the mirror and I say, am I making a Mission Impossible podcast? Is this really what my life is? <laughs> Is this all a dream? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yes, and the answer is yes. Then I look at myself yes. and I get, I get, I, I look and I, you know, right into my eyes and I say, yes, you are making it, and it is, it is <laughs> fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and this episode is really awesome. I'm so excited about this one. This is a something we've really never done before. Um, but will probably become more semi-regular in the future, I guess, as more and more people listen to the podcast and turn us down. But we are talking to <laughs> to someone who has never been involved in the franchise uh, and is just a fan and is in the in the community and is a professional and is one of the the most exciting screenwriters working today. We talked to Liz Hanna, who wrote The Post and Longshot and worked on Mindhunter season two, and uh, we had a great time talking to her. We got her husband involved at one point. He came in. <laughs> yeah. This was like, I mean, I think maybe for some context, this was pretty early on when the lockdown happened, I think. So, you know, we were we were all, I think, a little bit stir crazy. And, and, and at the end of this at the end of this interview, we we do uh, Liz ropes in her husband to come talk, you know, to talk about Tom Cruise's hairstyle. So it was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> we just want to preface, uh, as Charles said, that we did record this a while ago, and we actually do talk a little bit about the Atlanta child murders because that is the primary focus of Mindhunter Season 2, which is on Netflix right now. And obviously, if we had talked about it more recently, we would have talked about the larger issues going on in the country right now and the Black Lives Matter movement, which uh, we are obviously very, very, very behind and have have tweeted about. And um, so we, we don't want anyone to think that we were skirting that issue or talking around it. We just recorded this a long time ago. So... We just want to make that very clear. And, you know, obviously, if you have any questions about that, we can send links to appropriate articles and, and places you can donate. But it just wasn't in the conversation when we recorded this. Um, so just know that. Yeah. And, and also, if you follow Liz on, on Twitter, she's been very actively promoting Black Lives Matter. And, and those uh, you can find she she's she's still tweeting stuff about that. Uh, regularly and so it's, she's a good person to follow for for other reasons as well but uh yeah her twitter handle is at it's liz hannah so it's i-t-s-l-i-z-h-a-n-n-a-h -N -N -A yes she is she's a wonderful twitter personality but has been very much on top of of all the things that are going on and we want this show to be kind of a a joyful break from all of that but we are very mindful of it and just wanted to to let you guys know and um, yeah, we've just got a couple of sponsors we want to give a quick shout out to. This episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon. Check out his podcast, My Favorite Album. Each week, Jeremy chats with a musician or songwriter about their favorite album of all time. And I think he actually had Liz on um, around the same time that we recorded this, but he got his up much quicker. And I think they talk about Joni Mitchell, I want to say. But yeah, uh, check right. out that episode. Yeah. And this episode is also brought to you by John B. So thank you, John. And Real Estate Interest LLC, commercial real estate for growing companies. So without all of these wonderful people, this show would not exist. And we thank you guys a lot. And we will be back after the show for a little, a little bit more. We're so excited to be joined today by Liz Hanna. She's worked with Spielberg. She's worked with David Fincher. And now, finally, she's working with us. I think that this is a very <laughs> clear step down in your career, but we are so thrilled to have you. I've been trying to get to this point for years, so I feel really honored uh, and excited to be here. Um, no, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I love this. I love this podcast. It's great. Oh, thanks. Um, well, the reason we reached out is you are a, a professed fan of Rogue Nation. But I wanted to know, what is, are you it's super into the whole franchise? Is it just Rogue Nation? What is, what is your Mission Impossible story? Um, I'm super into the entire franchise. Uh, I saw it, you know, I, I saw the De Palma original uh, young and uh, 
well, not that young, I guess, unfortunately, but I saw it when it was in theaters. And I think like most of us, my uh, love affair again as an adult became when McQuarrie kind of took over and and joined the franchise. And um, I, I am a big Rogue Nation fan because it turns out they finally figured out how to have a female character involved that didn't just uh, <laughs> wasn't just there for uh, like a Bond girl um, and big fan of the Ilsa Faust character and Rebecca Ferguson who plays her. So I uh, my I'm kind of a franchise junkie like I am down for any franchise really like we my husband and I go see the Fast and the Furious movies in theaters we uh will see pretty much anything that's a sequel or a third film like very into the new Jumanji series um but I think uh Mission Impossible is great because it's just it's really fun and still feels slightly attainable in terms of reality it's not like uh you know The Rock is kicking a uh, cruise missile literally uh, across ice um so i think it's it's just a fun series and uh it has a real real movie star at the heart of it and so i i'm always excited that they're happening now as a professional screenwriter do you think you know i got a take on the next one can somebody get me in a room with mccory or is that like you just want to, I, you just want to watch these more I just want to watch these I would never presume to have any thoughts better than McQuarrie, <laughs> particularly when it comes to this franchise and so I feel like I would not want to dip my toe in that pool um t- in fear of ruining it and also fear of ruining my enjoyment of it but <laughs> uh I am like I, I actually find the Rebecca Ferguson character pretty interesting in terms of like new action sort of heroines and so that has definitely I feel like leaked into work I'm doing in just terms of like what does what would that character kind of look like in a standalone movie or you know what what does a female heroine look like uh now and and potentially in their own franchise and so I've definitely been inspired by it for sure uh I would definitely not want to uh dip my toe in the we are, we're always pitching some kind of a CBS all access show just about kind of like the 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 sub members of the team maybe get Paula Patton back maybe Maggie oh, yeah. Q yeah you know I'm in on that I okay. I think that's a, I I would definitely I think uh we can get a Jonathan Reese Myers uh, I mean, the thing for me is I really want, like, the Carrie Russell origin story. If we could get her back for, like, the uh, – it's it's Tom Cruise is her mentor and we're seeing her training, I'd be down for that. I guess it's sort of also, like, the Americans <laughs> pre, uh, pre, uh, prequel in some weird universe. Uh, but, like, that's honestly – when I – when the third one came out and Carrie Russell was a part of it, I was like, I'm down. I'm in. Right. I am I am ready. Buckle me up. Take my money. Um, I'm going to see it twice. I also just love like the slight Easter egg of uh, the Felicity alias connection because alias was uh, pitched by J.J. Abrams as like if Felicity went off in the summer and joined the CIA. Like that was what the pitch was. <laughs> and so it was a, I love the like sort of 180 degree or, or, or 360. Uh, we're back around to Carrie Russell's actually in Alias now. Uh, right. Be it for a few minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would love to see that prequel. Do you think that, that she and Tom Cruise slept together as trainer and trainee? I don't, there's some vibes. Okay. There's some definite vibes. I'm not going to say they did, but I'm going to say she definitely had a crush on him. Okay. And maybe he, like, shut her down because he was like, I'm your mentor. I'm not going to take advantage. But, like, how do you not vibe on Ethan Hunt? Like, I don't, right. I don't know. Yeah. He, he's an international <laughs> man of mystery. Uh, That's interesting. I, I, I always thought it was so platonic. Well, I mean, Luther, Luther makes that suggestion. I, I, mean, I mean, I think the other thing is, is, like, he's an international man of mystery who gets his ass kicked, like, every other day. Like, mm-hmm. he doesn't very often win a fight without, like, help, which I love, or, like, somebody falling off a cliff. So that's kind of the best part of it, is he's always getting just the shit kicked out of him. And, like, he feels re- – and, and also – Every time he does win a fight, he's just so happy it's over. It's not like he's, like, triumphant that I won. It's every single movie when he wins, he's just like, thank God I don't have to continue hitting this person. Right. they can stop hitting me. Yeah, we always talk about how Ghost Protocol really brought in a lot more of that humor and guys being bigger than crews and stuff like that, which sure. has carried on through the, through the movies, obviously, but is... 
I think well, Henry huge Cavill, asset. like, yeah. yeah, Henry Cavill just re-energized his arms in one scene. So yes, yes. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit more about why you love Rogue Nation so much because uh, I'm I'm a little mystified myself. I think it's the hardest one to follow. Interesting. Um, but yeah, I would love to know what else besides Ilsa you love about the fifth movie. Well, I like that we are finally sort of getting Ethan on the run. Like we're kind of like he I get in in Ghost Protocol, he's sort of on, he's on the outs and but he's he's kind of like already on the outs and we've got the Renner character and you're kind of confused as like a little bit of who the lead of the movie is. Whereas like Rogue Nation, we're just fully in on he's the lead of the movie and he is on the run and he's got a dope beard at some point. Um, but honestly, for me, it's like it has a, a relatable, almost bond, like not relatable, but like a bond like villain, which I think is something they hadn't had before is sort of since really the first one with John Voight is like you've got a real villain that is accessible. You've got the friend story. Like, I love that Benji, it's like almost a road trip movie with the two of them for half of it. And and again, you've got, you know, sort of this female character that is a throwback to this like femme fatale from the 50s. I mean, I think it's it's kind of classically um, structured in that way and, and written that way and then shot that way. It feels kind of like an old movie, even with them going to Morocco. Um, so I think like for me, it just felt cohesive in this bigness for it and like what this what this franchise could be outside of the gadgets and like chain putting faces on and stuff like that so i and and i love that turn dot is in it and the score is great so i think there's like a kind of an all-encompassing this is um like a a franchise that can go farther than these one-off movies and feels like there's actually a thread of something that's going to become serialized throughout the the next few, which I think is a nice shift kind of from, you know, they had that a little bit in the third one with Michelle Monaghan showing up, but then Michelle Monaghan's gone. And so I think it's, it's for me, there's, there's threads of we're going to go farther and we're going to continue this story. We've also got one of my all time favorite Alec Baldwin line readings with Hunt it's just amazing. Um, <laughs> my husband quotes it all the time. Um, and so I, I think there's just, uh, for me, it became a cohesive franchise at that point. It was like, okay, now we're, we've got the ball and we're running with it. That's great. Um, yeah. I mean, were you happy with them continuing, you know, cause, cause fallout is really a part two of rogue nation in a lot of totally. ways. Um, so were you happy with that, uh, that decision? I was. I was really happy with it. I mean, I think at first I was like, where are, you, where are you going with it? I think the first three minutes of Fallout, I was like, huh, that's right. an interesting choice. We're <laughs> in a fantasy. I haven't seen that one. Uh, right. So I, I think that for me threw me for a loop. But I love that like Michelle Monaghan's back and we're closing that storyline and that we're actually getting into – you know, the character of, of Ethan Hunt rather than just he is, you know, a spy or whatever. I think, I mean, I guess three sort of started that of like he has a life outside of this and but you don't really dive into the scars of his past and stuff. And I think that scene with Ving Rhames and Rebecca Ferguson where in Fallout where he's like, you know, Ethan has only loved one other person before and, and this has happened. And I think that is an interesting choice in a way that you kind of look at like how Bond has been in the last 10 years with Daniel Craig is like you're actually getting into the psychosis of the character, not just he's James Bond and he drinks martinis and he has, you know, hot girls on his arm. Um, and so I think like there's something just deeper a little bit to for me to grasp onto in, in these last two films. And again, like I think McQuarrie is probably the only writer I could think of who could do this in that it's fun and thoughtful um right. but it's not too thoughtful you know what I mean it's like I don't have to think that much to enjoy it but if I want to think there's a little bit for me to grasp onto and there's a a, a a heart to it and there's um a real engine in terms of uh emotion rather than just plot right well I mean obviously there's two more coming do you have like what would you want to see from the next two I guess Oof, that's a big question <laughs> It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I take it. I take it so seriously. Uh, I feel like my husband is like his ear is up against the door, trying to <laughs> gauge what I'm going to say to this. Um, I mean, I think for me, 
you have to get some new team members in. You've got to get some fresh blood in there to, because uh, I, 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 I do feel like Fallout was kind of the end of that story in a way almost. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know that Ving is coming back in that way. Like, it felt like I was clutching my seat, clutching the pearls, waiting for Ving Rhames to die and fall out. I was like, please don't do this to me. I am not ready. I have not had my moment. And then when they do the whole scene between him and Rebecca Ferguson, I was like, he's going to die. 100%. He just had his goodbye speech. So thank you, Macquarie, for not doing that. Um, <laughs> but I think in, in the next one, I would like to see, I think, some some fresh blood. Um, you know, I think we keep going back to this idea of his past, which is interesting. Like, that was kind of what Rogue Nation and Fallout was about, was, like, him being haunted by, like, these ghosts and stuff like that. So I wonder kind of if that is thematically going to be in there. But what I would like to see is, like, I want to see Tom Cruise do some dope stunts. Mm -hmm. I want to see him run, like, obviously. It's not a Mission Impossible movie if I don't see Tom Cruise run at least, like, a a four-and-a-half-minute mile with one long shot. Right. Um, And I think in terms of the Rebecca Ferguson character, I would like her to continue to be – important to the plot and to the character arc rather than just sort of a part of the team, you know, and just like a piece of this. I think the thing that's interesting about her addition to the movies um, is that she actually has uh, a necessity to what the story is and doesn't just feel like an added on part of it. So um, I think that would be really cool. And then I guess we're going to have to introduce either Renner's coming back or we got to introduce who is uh, running the... uh, we got to figure out who's running IMF now. Yeah, we need we need Renner back in a big way. Is there anybody else you want to see come back? I mean, we we obviously we talk about Paula Patton and Maggie Q a lot. Um, the Kittridge is coming back, which is that's a cool. Wrinkle. I love that Kittridge is coming back. Yeah, big big Kittridge fan. Yeah, um, he's also the you know one of the villains of another phenomenal franchise. Clear and Present Danger, of the yes. Jack Ryan franchise. Um, I'm realizing that I actually think I have an issue with franchises. Like, that might be the only thing I've watched in the last 30 <laughs> years. Um, but super down with, so I guess maybe he could be running it, which would be kind of a cool throwback. But I do think he's been, like, in Alaska, you know, banished for the last 20 years. But right. who knows? Yeah. Um, who else? I mean, I loved Angela Bassett in, in, in Fallout. I thought she was such a great addition. And, like, she has kind of played that character in a dozen movies. Like, she's the same character in Mr. and Mrs. Smith. So maybe we get uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith tied in. I'm not against it. I'm wow. open to anything, guys. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, I, I think they would be great. Uh, but Renner is really the one that I, I'm excited to, for him to be back. I feel like they figured out his character in Fallout. Or, excuse me, in, in Rogue Nation. Like, I feel like he his humor came out and, like, his... Um, kind of being the one running it on the ground, so I feel like the, he kind of they kind of figured him out. So I'm hoping that's uh, what our return is. Yeah, Charles last night uh, during Macquarie dropped into our our thing last night, and I Charles saw asked that. If, uh, I saw that. Yeah, he asked if if Bassett is going to be back and if some of her deleted plot threads are going to return. And he he played it very coy, but I think it could it could be you know good that she she'll come back and get to explore some of the things they didn't get to explore. Uh, the last time. What, yeah, what are I those mean, plot threads, Charles? Well, he has just implied that there was more planned for Angela Bassett's character. And, and you know, they always talk about how this, they have to, with mission, you go where the story wants to go. You can't force it. And so they punted some story ideas for for Angela Bassett. And then I was, I figured that it, it's, that they would explore them more if he's going to, you know, someone had asked him to hear, about world building. Will there be more world building? And he said yes on Twitter a couple months ago. And so I figured they'd probably use some of those threads. But he, yeah, like he said, he played it kind of coy. He said, you know, we always keep stories, story ideas around and they, they usually do come back around. What a gift to have too much story. Yeah. Good Lord. Yeah. <laughs> I am like, half the time, I'm like, well, I got to get from page 20 to page 85. So <laughs> let's just have them talk for a while. Yeah. It's like, oh, we had all of these other character arcs. Um, wait, going back to who I want to return, yes. I cannot believe I was remiss to not mention Vanessa Kirby, also amazing addition from Fallout. Oh, love yeah. Love her and love the sneaky who her mom is. Like, what a great... Well, when we first saw it, my husband didn't pick up on it. And I was like, what do you mean? Her mom is <laughs> Vanessa Redgrave. It's like the greatest thing of all time. 
It's Max. She yeah, mentions Max. Yeah. I, I was just like so into it. I was freaking out in the theater when that happened. Me too. Yeah. I was like, also, what amazing casting to be her daughter. Like, it's just dope. Yeah. And she was playing like moderately insane, which I was really into. Yes. Like, I was just like, <laughs> let's give Vanessa Kirby some time. And hey, Macquarie, one of those storylines and the world building. Let's figure out what the White Widow is up to while she's being crazy and working for the CIA and and IMF and right. MI5. Yeah, um, we, well, she's supposedly back in the next two. Oh, yeah. So exciting. So, also, yeah. another That'd crossover franchise, Hobbs and Shaw. <laughs> Come at me, Statham. Where are you at? Why haven't you been in? You haven't been a villain in Mission Impossible yet. He's like a classic Mission Impossible villain. He would that be would a be great so villain. Well, you know, actually, thinking about it, did you... You worked on Mindhunter with Fincher. Did you ask him about his Mission Impossible? I did not. I did <sighs> not ask him. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, um, we really want to ask you about that process, though, working with Fincher. Was he the showrunner on Mindhunter, essentially? Yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, we had, um, there were, uh, it was Fincher and myself and two other uh, writers that were sort of um, running a lot of the, doing a lot of the work. And we had a head writer, but it's, I mean, it's really from Fincher's brain, you know, that's, it's his kind of baby and it's, he's the creative force guiding the entire show. And I think the thing about Fincher though, is he's, he's exceptionally collaborative. Like I had an incredible experience working with him. I worked on the show for two years. Um, I started on it like in the middle of production on the post. And then um, up until, you know, I, like a month before we premiered, and so it was a really long journey, and there was a, a there was a, a lot of writing involved. There's so many so many pages, and we had like we had some really <laughs> amazing writers um, come and help us out. And so it was, uh, but yes, I mean it, it, he's pretty much um, the one who everything runs through, and he's there day to day, and and um, you know he's the one that I didn't have to be on set, uh, and you know nobody else did because he was making sure everything was top notch. Wow. My uh, my buddy who was uh, my roommate in college and he's edited a lot of my work, he edited uh, episode seven, which is one of the ones you're the credited writer on. Oh, that's so awesome. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it was funny. We, uh, we, you know, it was such a collaborative experience. Like we had episodes that we wrote, um, you know, Courtney Miles, who's the head writer, uh, she wrote I think one and three and then did a lot of work on, on all of them. And um, I wrote... I guess five and seven and, and, um, and wrote seven with Pamela Cedarquist. And, um, it, it was really, uh, at, at a certain point, it's sort of like, uh, you just take a scene and write it cause you know, you're going to shoot and, and some people are better at certain things than others. And, and like Pamela was so amazing at writing Manson and really just had such a grasp for his voice and for the history of him and stuff like that. And so I, really can't take credit for that because she just really, uh, you know, she, uh, I would try it and send it to her and then she would just do make it better. Um, so, uh, I, I think it was really, it was, it was also just such a film school. I mean, when you get to spend time with, uh, somebody of that caliber, um, you just try and shut up and listen. And, and, uh, you know, I would say that, of the four times I would offer an idea, three and a half of them were very bad. So uh, <laughs> it, it was, you know, it was mostly trying to stay out of the way and, and do the work. And um, it was really, it was amazing. And Courtney Miles was also, had been um, Fincher's uh, assistant director for a long time. And she was a feature assistant director and she was the assistant director on Mindhunter season one. And she uh, wrote, a script and um, David was like, you're a, a really talented writer. Would you like to come on and do Mindhunter? And she ended up carrying the whole thing on her back um, throughout production. And, and wow. I, that for me is sort of this unknown story of Mindhunter is that like Courtney, you know, wanted to be a writer, wrote this. She's so talented, so, so talented and uh, just jumped in feet first and was like, yeah, I can do this. And, and uh, ended up saving all of our asses a lot um, with just how good she is. That's amazing. Was there a lot of interaction with the directors? Because it, was it Carl Franklin and Andrew Dominic? Were those the directors on your, on your episodes? Or were you on all basically working on all the episodes, essentially? Or how, how did that work? So I worked with Andrew a lot on that episode. He came on very early. Carl had, Carl was, they were, all of the directors were, I mean, it was David and Carl and, and Andrew. So they were attached early on. But Carl was shooting something else 
while I was prepping and I went to shoot another movie when we went into production. And so I wasn't on set for either of the episodes, but before I left, I was working pretty intensely with Andrew on um, episode five and getting, you know, that right. And, and again, it's, it was the Manson episode. So we were really focused on, on, and it, it's sort of like the middle episode of the season and, and kind of everything was coming together. So we were very focused on making sure that was right. And Andrew was a, is a huge sort of Manson family nerd. Like he knows so much about them and is really interested in them, interested in Manson specifically. And so there was a lot of work, um, in terms of making sure that that scene wasn't just, you know, about Manson, that it actually had an arc for the rest of the season and, and the episode in particular. And so that was really interesting to work with Andrew on. And, and he's so visual and he's so spe- specific. So that was really interesting. Carl, I unfortunately didn't didn't work with very much because I at that point had already moved on to a feature. We're both big fans of of, of both Carl and, and Andrew. It, um, Carl Franklin, I think, makes a lot of sense. He's done a lot of TV Andrew Dominic, I don't think has done much TV at all, and his style is so seemingly polar opposite of David Fincher's. How did that? I mean, did that marriage? I mean, it seemed to work fine because the show turned out amazing. But you know, did they work a lot together, or how did that go? I mean, I think the thing about um, Fincher is, you know, he is the people he works with. He, you know, works with them for a reason in, in terms of. Um, he wants them to be bringing what they can bring and not mimicking what he's going to do. Um, and I think there's a lot of freedom in that. It, it, in writing, you know, um, it would very much be sort of like, I want to get from A to D. Tell You can figure out how, you know, B and C work. It's not as sort of specific or, or there's not as much of a directive in terms of the map of how to get there. And um, so I think in terms of other directors, it's similar in that, you know, at that, at, by the point of season two happening, there's a style and, um, you know, he had done the first three episodes. And so there is a, a, an engine in place for the day to day and how it works, but very much he's, he's, I think, very freeing in terms of how other directors work and how they want to interpret the episodes that they're given. We have to ask you, do you think Wayne um, Williams so- did it? Charles, we have to ask this very question. Yeah. question. <laughs> I was about to ask that. <laughs> well, I can't wait. What is this? Uh, just do you think do you think Wayne Williams did it, or oh. did some of them? I think he did some of them. Yeah. I don't think he committed all of the murders. I think, you know, it was um, living sort of with uh, the Atlanta child murders for two years is a is a, by the way. A, a modicum of what these uh, families have had to deal with and, and still have to deal with, with such an unknown, um, open-ended, um, case. I tend to agree with John Douglas, who is, you know, who the show is based on and, and, um, is based on his book and based on his life or sort of, you know, taken, taken from his life. I tend to agree with him that I think Wayne Williams committed a few of the murders, if not the majority of them. Um, however, he was not, uh, the sole, you know, um, villain of that entire murder spree. You know, I think, unfortunately, it's a real example of people turning their eye, turning a blind eye and looking at a poor neighborhood and saying, you know, well, it's just the neighborhood instead of really, and, and being too focused on, at that point, you know, tourism and, and losing, you know, what at that point Atlanta had become. And, being afraid of a crime spree affecting that and they you know just didn't look into it in enough time and so I think if you look at that it was probably a rife place for unfortunately lesser um, people and and you know these villainous people to go in and prey on these poor children and you know there's a lot of evidence that there was a known pedophile you know who was there and Obviously, um, he had photos of some of the murdered children. And so I think there were probably a few people who took the opportunity to prey on these children. Yeah. So that that John Douglas book, uh, I read it, is is fascinating because um, I'm obsessed with the show, Mindhunter. It's my favorite show. I love David oh, Fincher, so, so I'm much. just obsessed. And serial killer stuff and Zodiac's like my favorite movie and Drew too. Uh, so in the book, he says, like you said, I think he says uh, Wayne Williams is probably good for like looks good like he probably did like maybe uh uh, you know committed like maybe a dozen of these horrible murders 
but that that there's a like a, a harsher truth that that the local authorities know about is there like were they covering up for somebody or what is that about like, there's like a, a, a sort I of think, a vague comment that he makes about it yeah i mean and not to speak for john but just in my interpretation of that i think the harsher truth is that they were willing to sacrifice the lives of a number of these children to make sure that you know the city didn't fold and make sure that the that people didn't know what was going on. Um, and right. I think they did not know to the extent of the national interest that would that would become a part. A, I think the extent of how many children were missing and murdered to the extent that the national interest would become invested in what was happening. And I think the real blowback um, that they were feeling in terms of race at the time and that they were basically saying that, well, these are young black children and we're not going to pay attention to them. So I think the harsher truth was the rampant racism that was alive in Atlanta at the time and the willingness that the people in charge were to turn a blind eye. Wow. It's such a sad story. And and the, and then in the book, like I, I, I really hope they do a season three at some point because the story continues because I think the prosecutors were kind of messing up the case against Wayne Williams and then John Douglas had to go down there and like help them get Wayne Williams to like go fly off the handle in court. I, I assume you probably did all the research about this. You know all about it. And but I, I assume there was a, a decision was made to not go further with the story at this point. Well, you know, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the story is about Holden and Tension Wendy. So it was, you know, following their uh, their. I hate this word, but I'm use it. It's going to happen. Their journeys through this. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it had to happen. Um, <laughs> their, uh, their arcs through this crisis and, and through this tragedy. So, you know, the the story has to end at a certain point um, for them in terms of that. And yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a lot of research done. Um, we had amazing uh, research assistants and Courtney herself is just kind of a, plethora of knowledge and somehow retains it like I kind of retained it for about two years and then the second the show dropped it was almost all gone and and I, I just did another limited series and we uh, had a break during we, we broke the room obviously during the holidays and by the time we came back I was like I it's just pouring out of my ears one of the other writers and I were like we have to push it back in because it's going to fall out um, but I think uh, yeah so we did a lot of research and, you know, as depicted in the show and, and as John wrote about in his book, you know, there were a lot of mess ups during that time and not specific necessarily to Jesse Atlanta child murders. I mean, there were hundreds, if not thousands of cases that, um, you know, forensic science wasn't clear yet, wasn't widely spread. And so they weren't collecting, you know, the carpet samples. They weren't preserving the crime scenes. They weren't doing these things. And so a lot of the things that could have maybe given a more clear answer as to how much Wayne Williams was involved, um, I think, unfortunately, because of the forensics and because of the time and then because of of the neglect by the police department uh, and the greater sort of Atlanta um law enforcement for the neglect of taking so long. They just didn't have the amount of evidence that they could have had had they gone in earlier. We want to just talk, hit on a couple of your your other amazing projects. I mean, what was it like going from a blacklist script to having Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks, and Meryl Streep shooting your movie? I imagine it was like the most surreal experience ever. It was very weird. Um, <laughs> that's probably the best way to say it. You know, I get I get asked I get asked like about it, rightfully so, because it was insane uh, a lot. And the best thing that I can say is that it was really great that it happened as quickly as it did. Because if I had taken a brief moment to pause and think about how insane it was, I would have totally psyched myself out and not being capable of, of really, uh, functioning. Um, so, uh, it was, it was very nice that it happened as quickly as it did, um, for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is that I think I embarrassed myself slightly less than I would have if I'd had time to think about it. Mm -hmm. But honestly, you know, it's, it's, um, it was amazing. It was weird. It was crazy. Uh, it gave me my career and it also introduced me to people who are not only, you know, these giants in our industry, um, rightfully so because they're 
you know, extremely talented and, and smart and capable, but they're really lovely people. Um, and I think that probably the greatest thing for me personally to come out of the post outside of sort of professionally was that I just learned to, you know, really love what I do and, and take um, the time to appreciate that, that this is what I get to do. You know, Stephen uh, is, is the happiest person I've ever met who works uh, in film. Like he's so excited every day that he gets to go make a movie um, and he has so much fun doing it. And, you know, that's for somebody who's been making movies for, you know, 50 years and, and making the movies he's made, that's really encouraging and really lovely. And, you know, that's not to say that there aren't stressful days, but, you know, we're not pouring concrete. And when we're not, uh, you know, I mean, talking about what's going on now, we're not doctors or, or, or um, medical professionals or any of that, you know, uh, uh, we're not saving lives. But I think the thing that was really amazing is um, appreciating that what we can do is sort of give people a couple hours outside of whatever their normal lives are and distract them and entertain them. And, and there is a responsibility and a real um, honor to be able to do that. And so that's, that's what everybody who worked on that movie felt. And so that was really the thing that I learned to take away from it and, and also to just not put as much pressure on, you know, what the experience has to be. And, and, you know, Rick Carter was our production designer on it, who, you know, in these titans of industry is one of, of probably he's at the top of his list and, um, and a, a very high at the top of mine in terms of mentors, um, he would pull me aside every day and be like, okay, so now remember which part of this, you know, appreciate this part of it. And um, he really was, he took the time to help me understand and grasp what was going on and, you know, not literally have a panic attack every day. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm surprised Rick Carter hasn't done a, a mission movie yet, probably because he's just goes with uh, Spielberg to whatever he's doing next and has no time in between, but uh, he's the best. He's, yeah. the best. he's also, uh, I heard he, he took some long walks with Ryan Johnson for last Jedi on the beach. And so a lot of last Jedi, uh, stuff came from Rick. I mean, he's, he's a genius. He's an absolute genius. So, uh, I don't doubt that, um, uh, he was helpful in that scenario. That's amazing. You also did long shot last year, which I loved. And I also loved, you giving Jeffrey Wells shit on Twitter. Uh, that was <laughs> that was a high point for me. <laughs> you know what's funny? So so I have I go into like a very, very dark place when when things I do are released. It's it's you know, it's the culmination of however long you've been working on something and you're waiting for like the one asshole to say something mean to you and uh, and then I just ingest that um, constantly. So I have learned to not like to try not to go on Twitter and try not to um, use the word try because it doesn't really happen, but I've tried to not do it. And when that happened, I was already just like, I also the thing that I didn't say when this was happening was my, literally my dog had died the night before. And so I was, I had nothing to do except be on my couch and like look at reviews and feel horrible. And then Jeff Wells came out and said that. And I was like, you know what, man, come on, like really <laughs> just like that's this, this is what you decide to do with your time. Uh, and, and I was, uh, very, um, touched about the people who came to my defense. And, and I will also a hundred percent go on the record and say, I never got an apology letter, whatever he said, where he said he wrote me an apology that never happened. So no, he's too busy you know. bugging James Mangold for nude Ugh. photos of actresses and stuff. Ugh, uh, so gross. I don't know if you remember so that gross. story. Oh, I, oh, I found out about y that. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, I'm sorry about your dog. You have a very cute dog now who I love oh, seeing you. photos of. Um, yeah, she's insane. She's howling outside my door right now. <laughs> have you have you seen this dog, Charles? No. She's a uh, monster. <laughs> we're, we're big fans of dogs on yeah. this show. What what kind of dog do you have and what kind of dog was, was the previous dog? Our previous dog was a three-legged Great Dane lab mix. 
Um, and his name was Boo Radley, and he was just the sweetest, dumbest animal you've ever met in your life. Um, he thought he was a lap dog, but he was just quite, quite dumb, uh, which was really good for us because we're not that smart. So it was helpful that we had a dumb dog in our lives. Um, this dog is an Iranian. She's from Iran. So um, this family work is uh, lives in America, is from Iran. They go back and they save street dogs. And they bring them over here for it to be adopted. And so she is, uh, we think, an Anatolian Shepherd pointer mix, which unfortunately means she's very, very smart and very high energy. It's literally the opposite dog than what we thought we were going to get. We thought we were going to get another sort of like dumb, sweet, lazy dog. Uh, <laughs> and that did not happen. So uh, she's, but she's very, very cute. She's very sweet. She's just, like, way too smart for her own good and very, very vocal. Uh, lots of talking, lots of yelling at us when we don't do what she wants us to do. And um, <laughs> currently the most miserable animal that her parents are stuck inside with her all day. Because she's used to coming to my office or, like, going to the dog park for two hours. And now she's like, you fucks just sit on the couch all day. <laughs> That's all you do. Oh. Like, I'm bored. <laughs> I just want to do something. So I, I keep seeing all these people posting memes about their dogs being like, uh, I'm not going out anymore. I'm not taking any more walks. This dog goes on, no joke, we walk her five miles a day and she is <laughs> uh, going 100 miles per hour until like around 7.30 and then she just crashes until 7.30 the next morning. Aww. So we, and, but it's just 7.30 to 7.30 is just terror. She's just a nightmare. So thank God we don't also have children during this because I we would like have to move into separate homes to take care of them <laughs> at the same time. I have a I have an 11 month old and I have a dog too and and luckily our dog is extremely lazy. Oh good. Uh, I wanted to quickly quickly ask you are you because we talk about dog cinema on here a lot. Do you have any favorite dog movies? <laughs> oh wow, any favorite dog movies? I mean. I tend to avoid animal movies because I just am going to cry, like, miserably. So I, I yes. try to avoid them. But let me think. That's a great question. Dog movies. Hmm. Did you see Togo on Disney Plus? Because Drew and I both love that I movie. I did not see Togo. Oh, you got to watch um, it. You got to watch I, it. I will watch that. I mean, I feel like uh, Homeward Bound was really big for me as a kid. So that's probably the one yeah. I would remember. Also, if, is it Ro who was it Rosie O'Donnell was the cat? Somebody amazing was the voice of the cat, excuse was me, it? and I was like in very into it. Well, I know it wasn't Michael J. Fox one of the voices. Yes, yeah. Michael too. J. Fox was one of the voices. I think it was Sally Field. It was. Sally oh Field. yeah, you're right. You're right. It was Sally Field. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, before we get to some very important Mission Impossible questions that we ask everyone, you're about to direct a, a thriller. Um, yeah. Are you looking? I mean, are you looking at inspiration? Uh, will Will we see any Mission Impossible nods in in this this uh, very exciting new movie? Um. Uh, <laughs> interesting interesting i mean i did just write a scene where henry cavill walks into a bathroom and jacks his arms up oh my god uh, that, to recharge people, them people so, are gonna be able to spot that one i think i feel like that one might be a little too obvious yeah. um uh, he tears a sink off of off of the wall so that one it's weird too because it just comes in the middle of like a dramatic scene but th this is this is the elizabeth holmes project no she's here, directing right? uh, yeah, a movie so that's, this is yeah, yeah. So oh, is this uh, this is okay? I I so Elizabeth Holmes is a limited series um, that I that I just finished. We were actually supposed to go into production in May, um, but I don't think that's going to happen. So we'll see, um, you know, kind of what the timeline looks like. But no, I, I this book called Under Another Name that comes out next March um, that I'm going to write uh, to adapt and direct. That you know, I I'm not allowed to say anything about the book, but there is actually kind of an interesting potential Mission Impossible thing that could happen. So Ooh. in terms of, in, <laughs> wow. in, in terms of like, not at all in terms of story, but in terms of like, cinematically. Okay. Well, now we're going to, so, we'll we're going to be even more excited to watch this. So we have two very important questions. I think you're going to do great on both. First one, <laughs> we want you to rank Tom Cruise's hairstyles. Oh, throughout great. The series. I love this. Yeah. I love this question. Okay. My husband and I have done this before. <laughs> It's really, it's quite embarrassing, but I have done this. Okay, so my my number one hairstyle for him is controversial. It's my favorite Cruz hairstyle. It's akin to his A Few Good Men hairstyle, which is probably why I like it. 
Mission Impossible 1 is my number one rank. Oh, love we love that. that. Yes. We love that. Nobody love, ever says finally. that. I love it. Yeah, because Drew and I love that hair. I think it's great hair. It's great hair. Um, I think I'm going to go after that. I'm going to go Fallout. I okay. like his little, like, little long, little short. Yeah, we um, call them the micro bangs. Y- yeah. Yes, yeah. I like the micro bangs. <laughs> and then I'll probably go three, which okay. is a little bit like Fallout. It's kind of like a shorter, yeah. longer-ish, shaggy Fallout-ish. It's kind of... It's kinda- Perfectly in between Fallout and One. It yeah. is. It also like perfect to catch glass in your hair and shake it out. It's like great. Yeah. So then I go three, <laughs> and then I'll probably go Rogue Nation, which I believe is my husband's favorite hair. It's like his his long look. Is he at home? Uh, Does he want to come in and chime in on his favorite hairstyles? <laughs> he could. Let me text him. Let's see. Hang on. I'll go. Let's, he. It's honestly we've had this conversation before, which is hilarious. Um, Hang on, I'm tell so you don't like here. the longer haircuts because now you're you're getting Ghost Protocol and two are getting pushed to the bottom here. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we know how that ranking is going to go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so then it will go Ghost Protocol and then Mission Impossible 2. Uh, Mission Impossible 2 is just I can't get behind it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Cruz. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Mission Impossible 2 is a leap for a lot of people. We like four's hairstyle because it's kind of an evolution of two. It's a little it more is. shapes. You know, there's some shapes in there. It's a little more layered. Yep. But... We appreciate it. I'm glad you guys are with me on one because I feel uh, he just said why I don't want to be on the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's no offense to you guys. He hates being on podcasts. I had to twist his arm to do a trivia podcast with me. (laughs) I'm like, just come in here. So, but he, uh, yeah, he hates being on podcasts, (laughs) but I'm going to make him do it because it's honestly, it's a real debate in our household. I'm really in on one. I feel like one is also a very underrated standalone Mission Impossible movie. Like, yes. I feel like yeah. we don't often get just, like, this, you know, sleek, very thoughtful, kind of hitchcock at, at times. Come here. We're ranking Mission Impossible hairstyles. Hairstyles? <laughs> yeah. So we're talking only Ethan's hairstyles? Yeah, yeah just his, like, yes. if you could rank yeah, his throughout the, the series. Wow, well, Liz loves his look from the first film. <laughs> I, so I find it a little boxy. <laughs> oh, like okay. Can, there's there's real like edges. It's almost like a flat top. Mm-hmm. I, um, I love four. Ah. I'm I'm a big I'm a big fan. That's what they just picked. Yeah. I mean, when he's up top, you know, climbing the building and the winds in his hair, he's like running through the sandstorm. I, yeah. Peak look. I also am a big fan of, of five. Okay. But um, but yeah, but I mean, I, I mean, I love them all except for two, obviously. <laughs> but I mean, that goes without goes without saying. You love all your Tom Cruise children. Equally. It's just that's just too much hair. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, but but he's he's got great hair in general. His hair is underrated. Yeah, Tom's in, in general. <laughs> and, and you know hair. his hair says a lot about the character too. Like the first one, we always say, oh, he just got out of the army or something. Probably he's a new Absolutely. recruit to to the IMF. That's why his hairstyle looks like that. It's, gr- it's growing in yeah. a little bit. Yeah, the fourth yeah. one he's been in prison. In the first one also he wears masks so much that maybe that's like the theory was that it's like well, easier hair do for like on or off. I yeah, it's, it's, military. it's very military. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, I'm passing these headphones back. Wow, that, that was great. That was, a, that was great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just made his morning, guys. Wow. Really excited. Wow. Yeah. So is this is his love of the fourth hairstyle kind of a bone of contention or what? Yeah. Well, it's the one in four discrepancy that's really a, a topic of conversation. <laughs> I, I I feel I disagree. I do not think it's boxy, but I also agree that like you know saving two. It's just that we shall not talk about. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I do love all my Tom Cruise hairstyle children equally. Yeah. I, you know, I'll take any of them. <laughs> it looks like he's back to short for seven and eight, which we're very excited about. I'm very into that. Yeah. Very into that. Yeah. So the the last question, obviously, is just if you could rank the movies uh, from your, your favorite to least favorite or your least favorite to favorite, if you want. I'll do I'll do favorite to least favorite. OK. I'm going to go Rogue Nation. And then I guess I, I have to because it's sort of a two for have to go fall out. OK. Then I'll go. F- then I'll go one. Yeah. OK. Then All right. F- then three. Four and two. Wow. Wow. So you're not a Ghost Protocol fan, or at least not as much of a fan. I I just think that for me is kind of the what are we doing movie a little bit. Like it kind (laughs) of, it's it's unclear. You know, 
It's also the movie which unfortunately was supposed to be like the handoff to Renner. And so it feels a little bit like where are we going with the Renner storyline and the Ethan storyline. So uh, that I like feel like I can feel that in watching the movie is that it's a little unclear. But I love I love Paul Patton. But uh, and it's also like, you know, Russia and nukes. And I was like, we couldn't figure out something better than that, guys. We've seen that. <laughs> I was like, the hunt for Red October was like 40 years ago. Come right. on. <laughs> wow. Well, I love the the Ilsa character is so amazing, like you were talking about before. But I, and I feel like the Paula Patton character was the a good sort of like stepping stone toward Ilsa. It was the first like female character that had a, had an arc to herself. And, totally. And, and uh, I thought that was a, a great thing about Ghost Protocol as well. Totally. It was also nice to have the entire cast of Lost in one movie, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, we, we really wish that uh, Josh Holloway did not get iced so so quickly in that one. Yeah. He He's would got be good, good hair in that one. That was when he, like, kind of lost the lost hair and was starting to be, like, uh, you know, it was a little bit like um, Tim Riggins. Like, I've lived yes. with this hair too long. I have to cut it at a certain point. So yeah. Mission Impossible is a good reason for him to cut it. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, I know. I'm like, Holloway, can we find out that, like, he's back somehow? I yeah, feel like we would maybe love that. He, I would be into that. He would be a good, like, now I'm a villain type of guy. Yeah. yeah like, or... sort of, like, Goldeneye, Sean Bean style, like, you left me for dead. I'm into that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Could be in the syndicate, one of the apostles. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Uh-huh. I mean, I really want Cavill to come back with half a face. I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in <laughs> on, like, mangled Cavill coming back and being, like, I couldn't shave my mustache for Superman. You guys are putting me in another movie. <laughs> well, Liz Hannah, thank you so much for for joining us on this podcast. I hope the movie gets to shoot soon, that we're all feeling better and back to work. And um, yeah, just thank you so much for, for accepting this mission. Thank you for inviting me on it. I, I uh, accepted it and I'm proud. I'm happy that I did. And we're back. Uh, she was great, and I was so excited to have her on, and I loved her insight. And um, hearing someone in the industry, I mean, I hear from you every week, but, you know, that's kind of lost its, <laughs> its luster. It was really interesting, didn't you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, she has, uh, a, yeah, I love her analysis of, of all the movies and, and how the, why the Ilsa character is so important and and uh, I also, of course, love that she's a big fan of the hair from the first movie. So we got got to you know respect that for sure. You know how much we love the hair for the first movie. So we're very happy to find kindred spirit in her there. Yes, uh, that that meant a lot to us. Maybe the most of all. So yeah, thank you, Liz. And we can't <laughs> wait to see uh, whatever you're doing next. She was prepping, I think, her her directorial debut before the lockdown. So hopefully, we get to see that sooner rather than later. So very exciting stuff. Yeah. Do we want to tease who we have coming up or anything? Or Well, we should plug our Patreon. You should check out our Patreon. It's, uh, it's at patreon.com slash light the fuse. We just did a episode about the 30th anniversary of Dick Tracy and Gremlins 2, two movies that are totally bizarre that came out on the same day, and we love both of them. And I wanted to say, actually, that I was a little bit bummed I forgot to say in that episode, we, we, you know, we talked about both movies and how, why we love them so much. And we, we neglected to bring up the one of my, maybe my favorite joke in Gremlins 2, this hilarious meta joke where they make fun of Phoebe Cates' speech from the first movie where she tells a story about Christmas and what happened to her father. And then in, in the second movie, they bring up, she brings up Abraham Lincoln's birthday. She's like, oh, Lincoln's birthday. And then she steps <laughs> forward towards the camera. It's just, I mean, it's one of my, I can't, I, I was just, I, I realized afterwards, like, oh, I can't believe I forgot to talk about that in that Patreon episode. But anyway, you can hear us ramble on about how much we love Gremlins 2 and why it's so great. And same with Dick Tracy and plenty of other episodes we're doing regularly. And also, I, you know, I think it's, by this time, pretty soon, Mission Impossible 7 and 8 will start filming. And as that happens, we will be doing episodes about the news related to when those things are happening. So, you know, you might not hear us talk about it here on this show, but if you do want to hear us talk about it and talk about everything that's happening with the new movies, the, we're doing regular episodes every week and uh, we'll be covering that kind of stuff. And so if you want to if you want to hear that stuff, f- sign up for our Patreon. Again, it's patreon.com slash light the fuse. And uh, and also with that in mind, I want to give a special thank you to Derek Klingle. And uh, and what else, Drew? 
Well, they could buy a T-shirt at uh, Tee Public. We've got a lot of great designs on there, including some fan-designed um, images that you can you can put on a shirt or a, a mug or whatever whatever you want. Um, and yeah, if you could also just tweet about us, uh, we're Light the Fuse Pod and Instagram Light the Fuse Pod, and tell your friends about it. Just I feel like a lot of people just don't know about us, so any kind of effort to get the word out really helps us. Uh, we really appreciate it if you could like. Uh, review, rate, and subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. It would be a huge help as well. And um, I can't tell you how many kick-ass episodes we still have left to unleash on the world because we we got a lot, and we're very excited. So you want to come back because it's it's great. Wouldn't you say that, Charles? Yeah, you're going to want to come back next week. Next week, our episode drops on the fifth anniversary of Rogue Nation. And for that, we got a special guest. We brought on Seth Graham Smith, who was in the writer's room for Rogue Nation. And he talks about how that writer's room worked. And he talks about uh, working with Christopher McQuarrie on developing the story. And I mean, he tells some really funny stories about uh, about uh, about how much he loved working for McQuarrie and, and how much of a genius McQuarrie is. It's it's uh, it's a really great episode. You're going to want to come back for that. And we'll be celebrating that uh, next week. So so definitely come back. All right, guys, until next week, this is us. Bye. Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.